Good afternoon to you. Mark Sadath, HurricaneTrack.com here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Monday, November the 6th, 2017. It's been a little while since we've done this, but I figured I would jump in here because we do have another tropical depression to talk about. And we're almost to the end of the hurricane season, so that's good. And then we're going to start focusing on the off-season. And a lot of things happen in the off-season. And then it'll be hurricane season again. Remember, it's six months long, June through November each year. And those six months that were not in hurricane season typically go by very fast. And we have a lot to talk about during the off-season and uh, it always continues around here. We don't turn the lights off and unplug the computers and power down the room, so to speak, until June 1st. Uh, there's always stuff to talk about, including winter storms, but luckily none of those along the East Coast right now. So let's get started with what's happening today. First of all, a look over the first 10 days of November and where we would expect development to occur based on past performance of the Atlantic Basin and you can see that the largest cluster in terms of frequency is down here in the west and southwestern Caribbean uh, everything else seems to be generally random and spread out over a very large area some in the tropical Atlantic here the other areas are in the subtropical Atlantic and they are pretty widely scattered few and far between as you'd expect this time of the year and this time getting into the first part of November much less frequent activity overall. And in the eastern Pacific, uh, this area is dying down even quicker, and there's actually more activity in the Atlantic Basin than there is in the eastern Pacific region during the first 10 days of November, which is interesting because in the first part of the season, you know, the eastern Pacific starts May the 15th, technically on a calendar or whatever, and usually this area is more busy than the Atlantic earlier in the season and then it kind of flip-flops as we get into November. Just thought I'd point that out and you can see that dating back to 1851 way more areas of development in the Atlantic Basin than we see in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, so looking at the sea surface temperatures this is part of the story here and let's zoom in on this. This is updated uh, today I do believe or certainly recently uh, the 5th so that was yesterday that's fine and this comes from the um, National Climatic Data Center and NOAA based on the Reynolds method of sea surface temperature analysis. These are just different methodologies with background states. How far back is the sample going, etc. And so this is really nice because it shows these contours, these isotherms or lines of equal temperature. And you can see that what we're looking for, let me draw it in blue so it stands out better. Uh, right there, that's the 26 degrees Celsius isotherm and that's about 79 and a half degrees Fahrenheit or thereabouts and you can see for the most part everything south of this line is still warm enough generally speaking for tropical cyclone development and so that's a good deal of the Atlantic Basin including the main development region still very very warm but the tropical waves become weaker this time of year and upper level winds are usually strong out of the west and southwest and so we usually don't look this far east in November, despite the fact that water temperatures are still fairly warm. But notice that they are also fairly warm out here in the subtropical central Atlantic, 26, 24 degrees uh, Celsius or so. You know, so 78, 79 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface. And that being said, that means that we can still get development. And there it is, tropical depression number 19. If everything had become a named storm, we would be just two storms away if this develops into Rena. Uh, that's the next named storm, R-I-N-A, Rena. We'd be close to using up the list once again, but we had a couple of depressions that never made it. Um, but we'll see. Maybe this will become Rena. The good news is it'll stay out in the open Atlantic and it is not forecast to affect land anywhere. I believe that it will become a tropical storm uh, before it rounds the edge of this big strong high pressure that's sitting out here and heads out into the Atlantic where it may not be as strong but it may impact parts of the British Isles again maybe the uh, Scotland or Ireland area we shall see certainly bringing more moisture for you in the next several days I'll show you that of the GFS in just a moment 
So there it is, another system, probably going to become a name storm, Tropical Storm Rena. And this is what it looks like on the wide shot, visible satellite picture. And uh, clearly you can see there it is right there, a small system, but purely uh, in its tropical state, warm core, has a decent banding look to it. Uh, and, you know, in, in, the era, in the era before satellites, what were the odds that any ships would be passing through and collect data on something like this? I mean, back in the uh, 17 and 1800s, I would assume that a lot of the shipping lanes were going to be farther to the south to take advantage of the trades to get over here to the Antilles, etc. So some of these subtropical storms, storms developing in the subtropics, this is definitely purely tropical. Uh, it's over very warm water, probably 80, 81 degrees. Uh, but these probably got missed 200 years ago. In fact, I'm sure they were. So satellites give us a boost. Uh, and, and this isn't a wasted storm or whatever. I mean, you can see as clearly as I can, especially if we look at the uh, close-up, it's not very well organized. But how many times have we seen something like this close to land in the Gulf of Mexico or off the southeast coast? You think about Julia last year. Uh, I mean, you know, hey, for November, it's doing pretty good for itself. And uh, right there earlier in the day, it had a pretty good little band right there. Probably was a tropical storm if recon had flown out there. Uh, so in the postseason, if it doesn't make it in the next couple of days, I bet they go back and analyze this, and this will be a tropical storm. It certainly has the deep convection. You can see some of these overshooting tops right here, and even a couple of these lumpy potato-looking tops, which indicate that they are way up in the atmosphere on the east side of the circulation. Um, so look, it's near 30 degrees north latitude and about 50 degrees west longitude right in here. You know, the center is just south of there, but this is a good junction. So let's find that on the sea surface temperature chart. All right, so there's 50 degrees longitude right there, and there is 30 degrees latitude right there. So it is roughly centered right in here, and yep, lo and behold, water temperatures are just marginal, marginal enough for this to develop, and it'll probably do so uh, over the next couple of days. And what it's going to do, it's going to kind of mill around a little bit, and it's going to take off in this direction, around the periphery of this large high-pressure area to its east. And we can see that here on the analysis from the GFS. This is the wide Atlantic shot, so there's the west coast of Africa right there. The east coast of North America, there's North Carolina and Florida. And the north coast of South America, Bermuda for reference, is here. And then up here is Ireland. And watch what happens as I put this into motion over the next five days. That right there is the depression. And you can see that the vorticity signature gets stronger at about the two-day time frame, somewhere right in here. And I'm going to run the loop again. Look how the energy does pinwheel around into Ireland and then down into France even. But watch right here. I'm going to take the telestration away. And you notice right there, that's about 30, 40 hours. Right there at about 40 to 48 hours, uh, it looks like it reaches its peak intensity in the vorticity the signature of the bundling of that energy right around that low pressure area. Marginal right there, right there, right there. And then all of a sudden, at about the two-day mark, it looks like it reaches its peak. So I expect, based on the modeling, that this will become a tropical storm. It'll add a couple of more ACE points to the season total, the accumulated cyclone energy, and make this season certainly, well, it already is, but solidify and anchor further its place in hurricane history as being one of the busiest, one of the most intense, and the absolute most destructive season in the history of the Western Hemisphere. And that is not hyperbolic, you know, clickbait, headline-grabbing news. It is absolutely true. I was going back and working on stuff on my documentary for the 2017 season, and there are some headlines out there. Just Harvey alone is probably close to $200 billion in damage just for Harvey. That by itself eclipses Katrina by almost double, if I'm not mistaken. And it just depends on what data you look at in terms of the total economic loss, etc. But Harvey is easily, there's no question that Harvey by itself is already the most destructive tropical cyclone in U.S. history and then we had Irma, we had Jose, 
And yes, Jose was damaging for parts of the islands. It added insult to injury. And of course, we had Maria, and then we had Nate. Luckily, Nate was not as destructive as it could have been, being a rather late-season storm. But boy, what a year it has been. Now, at the end of November, on November 30th, I will have a special live broadcast as we wrap things up. If you remember, I did one on the first day. We called it Day One. And if my math is correct, at the end of the season, because each month has a, you know, they're not all 30 days long in the hurricane season. And so six times 30 is not 180 when you're talking about hurricane season, because some of the days or the months have 31 days, right? Like August and July and, of course, October. So you add those ones and then you get 183 days, right? I think I'm right about that. Basic math, Mark. So, yes, on November 30th, we're going to have a special live ending to the season, and it's going to be called Day 183. And we'll go back and look at some of the prophecies that were laid out on Day 1. Did they come true? And some of the missed forecast. And some of them were bad. I mean, they were, you know, the El Nino and all that. Oh, man, we have a lot to look at where a season way overperformed. You remember 2013 way underperformed, and everybody was like, well, what's the value of seasonal forecasts? They stink. But what happens when the seasonal forecasts bust because they weren't calling for it to be busy enough? Do people get as upset about it? These are the things we got to discuss. And as I've said before, the science is still young. you got to start somewhere. But this season definitely taught us a lesson that, it, you know, it's just a matter of time. All right, well, that's it for now. I'll probably have another update tomorrow and, you know, through the rest of the week as we see what's happening with potential Rena, and we'll see if my prediction is correct that within the next 48 hours it becomes a tropical storm, and does it reach its peak within that time frame? I think it will. Have a good rest of your Monday. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back with you again tomorrow.